Welcome once again to The Sage. I'm Dr. Kechio Buago, your guide on this show. I have journeyed with you on many other episodes. But this particular show gives me a great deal of joy. I'm excited. <laughs> That's the only word I can find about what we're going to discuss today. I have a special, special guest for you. But before I go into telling you who the person is and what the person does, let me just say that the topic, the substance of the show today too, is one that personally gives me not just physical joy, but spiritual joy, spiritual fulfillment. We had talked before about creative arts. It's amazing. It's amazing the sheer power, the sheer potential of doing good, of uplifting the spirit, of inspiring the world to be a better place, to be the best it can be. I, come, I think comes from no greater source than the creative arts themselves. Today, my guest features something that is truly remarkable, the gift of words, beautiful, inspiring words, words that move you to action, words that lift your spirit. I might even say words that lead, take you to heaven and remind you what heaven would look like someday. But they're also beautifully crafted, artistically crafted words that will make you push you to action. Action in a positive way. This show discovers treasures. But today in particular, I think if there's a word more wonderful than a treasure, I don't know whether it's a gem, I think we have a germ. We have a beautiful, wonderful germ that is our own homegrown one in Nigeria. I will keep you in sus suspense. You will still meet him. He combines two wonderful attributes. The power of words. Beautiful words. Beautiful spoken poetry. But combined with that thin with characteristics that actually make it spiritual with a heart that truly truly loves this country that loves nigeria that loves others i will unveil our guest to you stay with us we'll be back Welcome back to the show. Thank you for staying with us. I'm still busting with excitement. But I did promise I will finally tell you who our guest is. It's no other than Mr. Dike Chukumerije. Thank you. Thank you Ma, for having me. It's a real pleasure. Dike is household name everywhere. I remember as my camera team were coming in and we were preparing for this show, I said, do you know who we have today, DK? And they were excited. Oh, yes, we know him. We know him. <laughs> so you are a household name. Everybody knows you. But for the few out there who perhaps don't know, DK is a poet, a master of the spoken word, an artist, an advocate, for our country, for the good of our country, and advocate for young people. And I also like to claim him a little, and therefore I'm going to share the secret and, say, and confess publicly <laughs> that he's the son of a very good friend of mine. And so as I've watched you these many years do what you do, I've taken the pleasure of a mother in seeing one of her children blossom and grow and turn into something spectacular 
DK, welcome once again. Thank you very much, ma'am. I've never been welcomed so richly. <laughs> <laughs> As only a mother could. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much. No, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of you. And I know your mom, Weibo, my darling sister and friend, um, is loading me on as she watches the show. <laughs> Welcome, DK. DK, you. you're a lawyer with a master's degree in law. How did you end up doing what you're doing? Tell us about it. Tell us about yourself. Uh, well, long before I became a lawyer, I've always, I've always written poetry. Poetry is my first love. I came to it early because of my big brother, Che, who is a poet. And... Uh, He's also my idol, like any little brother, I looked up to him. And so my first poems were literally copying his poems into my exercise book, which used to irritate him sometimes. <laughs> he told me that, that that's, that's plagiarism. I didn't know what that word was. But that's how I started writing poems, by copying his poems when I was really, really young. I also come from a very creative family. Uh, and also a very literary family. My father was a journalist at the time. My mother is a fantastic storyteller. She can regale you with stories and keep you, I know, <laughs> keep I know. you in your seat. Uh, my brother, like I said, is a poet, a musician. I had a brother, that, my sister is an artist. So growing up, I was surrounded with books and I was surrounded with art. So it was a very natural way of expressing myself. Uh, and so eventually, reading law was sort of imposed on me, you know, because my dad asked me what I wanted to do. The plan was that I was supposed to become a medical doctor. That was his plan for me. Okay, but yeah, then, it has to be a doctor, a yeah. lawyer, or an engineer, you know. Or, or a disgrace <laughs> to the family. <laughs> <laughs> so when, he, when I was supposed to do medicine and I, I you know, did all the science courses, physics, chemistry, biology, and it was, I was struggling with those subjects in secondary school, but I just realized that it, it, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. So without telling him, I dropped, I think it was physics and biology or something in school. And so when he found out, he was furious, you know, furious. And then he looked at my subject and said, well, the only thing that you can read that will redeem you from disgrace in future is law. And that's how I ended up reading law. <laughs> So he said, you're going to read law, and, and so I did. I don't regret it, though, because law, you know, is about stories as well. Uh, and there's a lot of reading, which are things that I like. So the, the poetry was before the law. The law was on t sat on top of it. And uh, poetry has always helped me to live life. It helped me growing up. It helped me get through the traumas of growing up, peer pressure, broken hearts, struggling in You school. had broken hearts? Ah, uh, yes. I don't uh? know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, writing helped me to deal with all those things. It was part of, I didn't know it was a career. I didn't know it was something you could do. It was just a way of getting things off my chest. I'm a quiet person, very introverted. People don't believe it, but I am very introverted. And um, there is a three-year gap between me and the next person, my elder sister. And so oftentimes, as a little child, when I want to intrude on their conversations, they'll say, this little boy, what do you have to say, you know? So I started learning to put it down. You okay. know? That, so that's how it all came together like that. Uh, it was just something I've done organically and naturally. And I am the first person that is very shocked at what it has become. But it just goes to show that God doesn't make mistakes. Absolutely. If he puts a desire, a gift, you know, something in your heart that just one of those things you can't escape. Every time you wake up, it's there. It's a thought, do this, or an urging within you. God doesn't make mistakes. You need to follow through. You need to just stay on it. You may not understand where it will take you or how it will take you to certain places, but I believe that if God puts something in your heart, then it's for a reason. You need it, and the world needs it. So you need to be faithful to whatever natural gift that God has given to you regardless of whatever other formal qualifications you pick up along the way. So in my, in my case, I've, I've been fortunate that I've, I've been able to stay with this gift unbroken since I was a child. And I think that, that that is what helps with the kind of quality I bring to it, because it's still the spirit, the innocence of that child that still comes through in, in the poetry. Wow, wow. The a few things you've said there that's 
I think I want to emphasize, I think it's wonderful. First of all, it's what God gives you. But the other one is to follow it through because it's for a reason. Yeah. It's for others also. Yeah. The gifts are meant to be shared. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes gifts are not meant to be kept for, for yourself. You. Yeah. But where have you found the persistence, the discipline? Because the way you say it, it sounds simple, but I know how much time you've devoted to organizing if events, yeah. literary societies, and so tell us yeah. about that. Yeah. Where did it all come from? How have you persevered? Um, discipline is something that parents have to teach their children, I think. Um, I'm also fortunate, I have to confess, that I, the, the family I was born into, um, apart from obviously literary things, it's also a sporting family. My family does taekwondo. And so, yeah, your brother is a champion, isn't brother, he? Yes, we're amazing, the amazing the siblings. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Taekwondo is a very disciplined sport. We all grew up doing it. And so, it gives you a lot of discipline in life, you know, to manage your time, to manage your body, to manage what you do. And because we're into sports, there wasn't a lot of time for drinking or partying. Or we just we grew up, it was a very regimented lifestyle growing up because we're always going for competitions. We also used to compete in terms of swimming. You know, um, we did both Taekwondo and swimming growing up and used to compete actively in Lagos, in the Lagos circuit. You know, so that, that gave me a lot of discipline growing up, you know, and you do need discipline. Uh, I, I, my dad always used to tell me that success is 1% talent and 99% hard work. Absolutely. It's something that has stayed with me all my life. Yeah. It doesn't matter how talented you are. You need to work as if you don't have talent. You know, uh, you need to hustle like people that don't have talent. Mm -hmm. So I've always brought that to everything that I do. Uh, and, and with the writing, growing up, I formed very early the habit of writing every day. Okay. People often ask me, oh, how do I develop as a writer? The only way to develop as a writer is to write. Right. You read and you write. And that's how you develop. You read a lot. You read. I like that yeah. too. The fact that you need to read. You need to, be, you need to read. Read widely. Yes. Read, you know. Read yeah. widely. Read other writers. And then write a lot. Make a habit of writing every day. Uh, because a good writer is not subject to inspiration. You don't need to wait to be inspired to, to write. A lot of people wait to feel a certain way or for a certain feeling to come over them. No. Just write. Everything, 99% of what you write may be very mundane and average, but that 1% may be brilliant. You know? So everybody, everybody's sort of collection of writing, every writer's collection of writing is like a pyramid. You have a lot of mundane stuff at the base. Okay, but at that's, the top, you have this, that's important to know. Yeah, so yeah. You, you have, that's how your collection is. So the more you write, the more like, you're more likely to produce those gems, those really remarkable pieces of writing. So you have to put a lot of stuff in there. So from very early in secondary school, I used to try and write a poem. Not try, I used to write a poem every day, regardless of what was happening around me. And I used to keep it in a collection. I had this higher education notebooks where I'll write my poems down. And, and so even now I have higher education notebooks going back to when I was about 12, you know, which is really when I started gathering all my materials. So the moment you form a habit early in life, you know, it's, it's very hard to break. It's already set, and I formed this habit as a child. So even now, I write constantly. I write all the time. And I write at will. I don't need to feel it. I don't need to have inspiration. I don't need to wait for any muse to show up. If I want to write, I just write, because I've been doing this since I was a little boy. That's very interesting, because um, I've often felt that, personally myself, I find that there are special times when you suddenly feel inspired about something, an idea. What I have learned is to quickly sit down and let it flow and put it down, you know, that, as, as it touches me at that time. That's also, I mean, I'm not saying there are times when yeah. you have a special flow. Okay. As a creative person, you know that sometimes when the peace comes to you, but I'm saying that in terms of developing your craft, you need to okay. just form the habit of Developing writing. the skill and yeah. the capacity. Just get into the it. habit of writing yes. all the time, all the time. When the inspiration comes, fine. I mean, I remember a poem. I did a poem for Chino Achebe when he passed. Uh, Nani, is it true? 
And uh, that poem was one of those poems that came by inspiration. Mm -hmm. You know, just sitting in the room and the words just there coming. I say, no, 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 is it true? You know, so really, I was just sitting down and the words there, and, and, the, and the poem just came. But then there are other poems that I've written over two years. I'll write four lines and then you just can't seem to get past it. You live it, you go on to something else. Or you finish writing it, but you, you're just not happy with it, so you keep it. And then you come back to it eight months later and you, you know, things like that happen. But whatever, if you are truly interested in, in writing and in creativity, it's important to remember that you have to practice it, that there is a craft, there is a discipline to it. It's not just about spirit and inspiration. There is a lot of hard work to it, about just getting up. Sometimes I just get up and I rehearse, mm -hmm. spend hours in rehearsal, you know, doing poems that you've already writ written, rehearsing how to perform your poems, which is something else other people take for granted. They think you just get up on stage and perform, but you rehearse it. Because over time, you start learning how to raise your voice or bring it down, what quality to give to your voice, what sounds to emphasize and which ones not to, what, when to demonstrate and when not to demonstrate. These are things that you practice so that you can have maximum impact when you speak. Great. There's so much more I want to ask, but we will. When we come back in the next segment, we'll make you actually share some of those wonderful, wonderful poems with us. Stay with us. We'll be back. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. But you certainly, I think, stayed for the best part of it. DK, thank you again for being with us. Thank now you. we want to enjoy it. You know, it's not every day that um, we get somebody like you to actually sit and perform for free. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to look back. You've shared the art of it, the fact that one needs to work hard. It just, you know, every gift needs to be perfected, yes. worked at yeah. all your life. You never really take a break. Yeah. Um, but share, look back. Share with us, if you don't mind, one or two of your favorite ones, you know. Let us, let us enjoy it. Well, I don't have a favorite poem, but uh, I'll share this one. I don't remember what it's titled, but it's about how Nigerians express love. Coconut head is what you call your dearest. Leave me, Joe, is how to say it best. If you touch me again, eh? Is the language of lovers, laughing and fighting under warm covers. See your mouth. That's how we kiss. That's how we invite the other to kiss. Miss you, Ke, is me telling you my world is incomplete without you. For the mother who loves me said to my face, I will kill you, this boy, and have another in your place. <laughs> and when I made her proud, she looked up and said, Yeah, yeah, with your nose like your dad. Come off a road, is the language of brothers. Walking down these our narrow streets, more effective than a warm embrace to look up and say, see your face, not deceive yourself, oh, is how to say it. When the other person says, you love me, just say it, I beg it, is the right response to let them know you're friends for life. For my father sat watching us playing with fire. Don't stop, he said, keep playing with fire. And when I graduated at the top of my class, he looked up and said, when do you start your master's? For this is the country where we catch naughty children and whack out the demons from their quivering bottoms, send them to bed with the spanking of life, then come back and watch them as they sleep. <laughs> but here in this country, when you say, go and how hug a transformer, if said with a smile, will make the heart warmer. And if I catch you, if you say just right, will not be interpreted as a threat. For this is the country where the language of affection is rough as seas and rugged as mountains, but our pillars are strong and our children still stand. For in spite of it all, the heart 
always knows when it's loved. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is absolutely beautiful. And, and you know, it resonates so well. As a parent, it you know, in fact, if I may dilute, at the risk of diluting the beautiful poetry, and say that my son, who is abroad in the U.S., said to his friends that mommy, my mommy tells me to eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so shocked. And I said, yes, see. <laughs> and he said, you see. <laughs> so absolutely, when we use those words, yeah. but it's with endearment. It's an endearment. And when we use them, the child, everybody around knows that it's actually a way yeah. of saying we're so proud of you, exactly. but we don't want your head exactly. to grow too big. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Dick, I'm going to ask you, it's beautiful, and I'm thirsting for more, so I'm not going to let you off. <laughs> I have to say one more. But before I do that, let me ask you, today you're, you're holding down a full-time job. Yeah. You're a happily married man. Um, you have wonderful children. How do you combine it? How do you manage to make mm. it all work? By not sleeping much. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, it's, uh, I, I, tr I don't sleep a lot. And I work around the clock because it's the, every segment of my life is very important. And I try and give it the attention it deserves. So it goes back to that being disciplined and learning from an early age to draw up a timetable and to stick to it. You know, so when it's time for the kids, it's time for the kids. When it's time for family, it's time for family. When it's time for work, it's time for work. And then when all that is done, because those are my basics, I need to cover my basics first. I wouldn't be out doing shows if I haven't settled the family front first. So when all the basics are settled and they allow me, then I can come out and do shows. So I do shows with the extra, with, you know, with the, the surplus of my, or with the extra, with the balance of my life. I do shows with that. Because uh, my dad also told me that you get no brownie points for paying school fees, for taking care of the children, and that's normal. And nobody's patting you on the back for doing any of that. They need to cover your responsibilities. After you have covered your responsibilities, what you do with the money that's left and the time that's left, that's what greatness is about. You know, so that has always stuck at the back of my mind that uh, my responsibilities are my responsibilities. I need to handle it, but I still need to make time to devote to my calling and my talent and my ability. That, you know, that's on me. I have to find the time to devote to this. You know, so that, that's how I do it. Dika, thank you. I'm going to, we're going to end by asking you to talk to the many wonderful people out there, young like you, who can do as you have done, and who I'm sure have learned so much from you today, with a poem mm. that says, is telling them what is your advice? What, which one of your many poems addresses the many young people out there? What would you like to say to them? When you wake up in the morning, treat it as a brand new day. Leave the past behind you and reach for the future with faith and with hope all the time. Do not be weighed down by the things that have gone before. Always believe that from where you are now, you can get to where you need to be. Because there is not just one way in life. There are many. And no matter how many times you've missed your way in life, there is always a connecting path from where God finds you to where he needs you to be. So always believe, always believe, no matter what. Make up your mind, and no matter what life throws at you, it will not break your heart, it will not break your capacity to believe that you and those around you are capable of more. As long as you refuse to be broken by the society you find yourself in, then you possess the power to change that society for better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any attempt to say more will be diluting an absolutely perfect bit of wisdom to the so many people out there. Dike, thank you. 
It's been more than worth it. Stay with us. Thank you. God bless.